Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Three Smart Questions at the Center for a Smart Future. And today we're joined by uh, a, f a former colleague. It's really nice to have her uh, with me again, uh, albeit on screen and not in person. We have uh, Julie Cooper. Hi, Julie. Hi, Hi Anushka. Um, Julie, you are joining us, I think, right now you're on mission. Uh, overseas, but you're resident in Australia. Um, so for, for everyone to get a quick introduction, Julie is an expert in public financial management, commonly referred to as PFM in, in uh, the PFM world. <laughs> She's worked for the IMF, World Bank, and large consulting firms. Uh, and she's worked in many countries, both large and small, uh, countries like Jordan, Egypt, uh, Afghanistan, uh, in Sri Lanka for a, for a while, but also smaller countries in uh, the Pacific, like Vanuatu, Tuvalu, and Tonga. Um, and like I said, she, she and I were colleagues once, and I really consider her um, one of the foremost voices on and experts on public financial management, which right now in Sri Lanka, I think is uh, uh, getting a lot of attention, talking about reforming the budget, reforming revenue collection, expenditure management, treasury reforms, and so on. So I thought at this crucial time when all of these issues and all of these questions on, are on everyone's mind, wouldn't it be great to talk to someone who has witnessed uh, the challenges and you know, successes in reform of uh, PFM, but also you know, the larger civil service um, with someone who's seen this in many countries. So, Julie, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Anush. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be, be here and um, it's lovely to see you again. Thanks. So, uh, Julie, our format is, and this series is three smart questions. So, let's kick off with our first question and let's start broad before we get into some specifics. Uh, many developing countries right now uh, are facing public finance challenges due to, due to COVID and various economic pressures coming up uh, now. Uh, what are some of the main tools that developing country governments have in their arsenal to build stronger public finances to ride out economic crises? Well, you're, you're right, um, Anushka, you know, the, the impact of COVID-19 on all countries, not just developing countries, like every, every country and every citizen, every person was affected by um, COVID-19. You know, and many countries, uh, countries implemented their own versions of, of how to deal with, with um, the, the, the pandemic. You know, more than 33 countries actually implemented lockdowns. Sri Lanka was one of them. Um, Australia was another. Um, Italy, United States, India, and you know, 33 uh, up to more than 33. So the economic fallout from the pandemic was brutal. It was immense. There was a large um, or a sharp increase in fiscal pressures for governments. You know, how do they reorient their budget? How do they do? How do? What do they need to do to deal with the crises? Well, the, the pandemic, um, you know, of course, and most countries did this, you know, to varying degrees of success in um, meeting the immediate health issues, you know, um, spending money on, on um, the, the hospitals and, uh, you, know, you know, saving people's lives. And then, you know, many people died. So there was, you know, such a impact on the economy where, um, because of lockdowns, uh, people lost their jobs. Um, some businesses went bankrupt. Um, so, you know, while we understand and I, I appreciate the lockdowns that happened, I think it saved many, many lives, but for sure there was a, a really serious impact on the economy. And so there was, you know, lots of economic and social issues raised from the, the pandemic. Now, um, what we have seen is that countries that had strong or stronger PFM frameworks were able to redirect their funds in a more efficient way to deal with the healthcare infrastructure costs, but also um, supplying, uh, being able to um, provide social benefits to people who may have lost their jobs or businesses who had gone bankrupt. 
know, there was lots of um, the, the countries with more efficient PFM uh, frameworks were able to dip into their coffers and, and, and able to redistribute their budget in a more effective way so that, um, you know, lessen or, or something to overcome the impact of the, the lock, lockdowns. So you asked about the arsenal that, you know, for countries with a weak um, uh, or emerging PFM practices, they don't have much. So they need to look at both short and longer term um, impacts, and they need to really focusing focus on strengthening their PFM practices, and and not only um, strengthening for normal business, but also look to what they need to do to deal with a crisis. You know, nobody, very few countries were really properly prepared for COVID. Even though most countries, like we'd all be, we all knew it was coming one day. There was enough evidence to say that this was going to be uh, was a huge, you know significant risk to the countries around the world um, and as I said you know some countries were better prepared because they did have strong PFM systems so countries need to build into their PFM frameworks this crisis management issue of crisis management and their framework that incorporates you know post-crisis recovery recovery includes a focus on fiscal and public expenditure reforms. You know, during shocks such as COVID, you know, I've said, you know, effective um, PFM made it, I won't say easy, but easier for countries to, to deal with the pandemic. So, you know, um, just to wrap up that question, initially all countries needed to um, respond to the immediate needs. And then they need, which was to save lives, save as many lives as possible. But then they um, need to focus on reforming their PFM practices. And importantly, you know, part of PFM is also instilling a culture of fiscal discipline. You know, you need to be able to have those frameworks in place and know that they're going to be followed. But one and one place, and this I've just got a couple of things where I think that um, developing nations can start. They need to make sure their budget is credible, um, you know, making sure that their macro fiscal estimates for revenue and expenditure are not politically driven and they're economically driven and realistic and achievable. One thing that, and I know I think Sri Lanka sort of struggles with this one a little bit, they need to mandate the implementation of a government-wide financial management information system so that Ministry of Finance has access, or not just Ministry of Finance, any think tank, anybody that needs access to data can get accurate and reliable data from one system and they're not struggling to pull information. Because of course, you know, your data is what's needed to make your, your economic decisions or your policy decisions. Um, they can, you know, make sure they establish a treasury single account so that all, um, Financial, financial resources flow in and out of this one um, treasury single account system. Again, it's, it's a way to avoid wastage of, of cash or having ca idle cash or having people misuse cash, you know, get it into um, one treasury single account system. And, and another thing I think, which often is um, developing countries struggle with because of the, uh, dilution or the power bases around around the government agencies but the ministry of finance should be the should be set up to be the apex agency for managing public funds they need to be supported your laws need to be put in place they need to have qualified um, and experienced people in place that they can do the job that they that the country needs to manage public funds thanks julian i think uh, a lot of what you said has a lot of resonance with Sri Lanka's current context and what the kind of measures we could have done, but in fact could even put in place over the next few years to strengthen uh, strengthen that PFM practice to uh, withstand shocks in the future. Um, so, you know, you talked about uh, the importance for a better PFM framework and focusing on, on uh, public financial management as a key reform area, uh, but I've also, heard you quite a bit uh, and consistently argue that civil service reform, 
can greatly enhance the likelihood of uh, the success of PFM reform. Uh, and uh, could you, could, and I know you've worked in government also and in some countries that have seen this success. So, so could you break that down for us a little? What is this link? Now, we agree in Sri Lanka also with the need for public sector reform. It's talked about a lot. We also agree about PFM reform. But you seem to make the case that PFM reform in the absence uh, of meaningful civil service reform is not going to work. And the, the reverse is that if one is done, it reinforces the other. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Anushka. I have argued that or suggested that or even recommended that for many, many years. Unfortunately, you know, civil service reform is always seen as um, overwhelmingly challenging and, and most um, governments are reluctant to undertake it. I must also say, you know, that in a lot of developing countries, the civil service is used as a social benefit, you know, where, and I think Sri Lanka does this, where they, uh, uh, they, they guarantee a certain amount of graduates from university will have civil service jobs. So every year, you know, you have this influx of, of young, inexperienced people um, into the, and so you end up with a bloated civil service, which makes it incredibly difficult um, to um, stimulate um, thinking and, and you, know, you know being creative and looking at ways to improve things because people are just sitting in chairs taking up space. There's not enough um, stimulating work for everybody to do. So I really have a passion for connecting civil service reform with PFM reform. And we have some really good examples. You know, back in the 1980s, New Zealand, um, Australia's brother, um, went through significant um, comprehensive reforms, which included both PFM and civil service reform. Now, New Zealand was so successful at um, what they did that it was termed a new financial public, a new public financial management. Um, and became known around the world and discussed by the IMF, World Bank. It was really um, became a leader. But let me go back to New Zealand's um, story. So in the late 1980s, New Zealand was facing increasing fiscal pressures. They had soaring interest rate and they had a falling dollar. So, you know, they, they were in an economic crisis. And so they sat back and said, what are we going to do? And luckily, the political players all came together. They had um, support politically from both sides that they knew that they could not continue, their country would not survive or would continue to decline if they didn't um, take a bold approach. So they did um, implement groundbreaking reforms to the entire public sector, which was policy, PFM and civil service reform. Now, and it also, apart from being called new public financial management, it became known as the outcome and output framework. And if I'm going to say I think there was a mistake, I think that might have been the mistake in that um, because it was termed outcome and output framework, everybody slanted their brain over to that it only, only, only relates to PFM reform and they started to forget about all the civil service reform that went with it. But in the New Zealand case, one critical component of the PFM reforms was aiming at improving the public sector. And they wanted to professionalise it and make it more like their private sector counterparts. And in that way, I mean, they wanted to make their, the public, the civil servants become more um, performance focused become more um, oriented that they were delivering, delivering outputs and outcomes for the citizens of the country or the people of the country. So instead of that, we were just here to do a job and push papers around. And I, and I don't mean to say that disrespectfully because civil servants do a very, very important job. But when they're bloated and they're not performance focused, it kind of feels like we're just doing a job. We're not focusing really what our impact on the lives of our countrymen are. PFM is about improving the lives of the citizens. 
you know, there's no other, should be no other reason for it. You know, we are here to make people's lives better, to give them more economic um, advantages or, or opportunities, improve, improve healthcare, improve education. So, you know, we often the public forget that that's the role of government and sometimes the civil servants forget it too, that we, are, we play, civil servants play a very important role. So once again, I get back to New Zealand by um, implementing these comprehensive um, civil service and PFM reforms. New Zealand was able to, and I'll just, I'll just have to read some of these, um, uh, some of this data. It comes from an OEC, OECD report. Um, their assessment of um, New Zealand applying the new public financial management model. And the statistics or the data included in this OECD re report says New Zealand was able to reduce their gross financial liabilities from 65% of GDP in 1993 to 23%. By, by 20, 2005, it had reduced to 23%. So, you know, so they're, they're indicating that these reforms had this quite significant impact on the economy. New Zealand was also able to have budget excesses over the preceding 10 years after the reforms were implemented. So instead of being in deficit, they turned around and now were in, in, um, in surplus. They reduced their net debt from 52% 50 of GDP in 1992 to near 10% in 2005. And they created, they say, the evidence shows that they created a more efficient government services. Now, you know, I think, think that's incredible. Um, that by unifying PFM reforms and civil service reform, they um, were able to restructure their economy and, and make great, um, have great results. Now, you know, because of those results, countries like Australia, UK, Canada, very quickly started to follow New Zealand's example um, with, with very good results also. So, and I just want to quote some of the results that Australia, which I was very involved with in the Australian reforms back in the mid 1990s. Um, I was the project manager for um, one of the Department of Defence, which is the largest um, agency in the, in the Australian federal um, government. Um, and so I know quite well how we implemented the outcome and output framework, but over as a result of that implementing both the um, PFM reforms and the civil service reforms, we saw in Australia a reduction in debt from a 25% of GDP in the mid 1990s to near debt eradication. And that's, that, that's really important politically because Australians, we have this concept that debt is bad. Um, don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but the general public will say we can't have any debt. So that was a really good political um, win. Gross financial liabilities were reduced from 43% of GDP in 1995 to 15% by 2005. And growth in real GDP aver averaging 3.6 yearly over the decade since introducing the new framework. So we can see that you know, PF PFM and um, civil service reform or public sector reforms um, ha can have this profound impact and great success. So, you know, many countries, many countries I've worked in, including Afghanistan, Jordan, um, Egypt, um, all, all tried to implement similar um, outcome output frameworks, but totally ignored civil service reform. And those countries are still struggling with establishing PFM reforms. Now, you know, when I, when I look at that, I, from a, from a um, people perspective, it's really hard to understand, or really hard to see how PFM reforms that are focusing on performance and improving, um, like, for example, you know, we see statistics from every country, they want to measure their impact of implementing gender budgeting or some kind of performance budgeting or measuring their outputs. Um, 
and and they have no impact. There's there's not much there because pe people in the civil servant service aren't rewarded for performance. When the civil service rewards people on seniority or tenure, then there's no incentive for any civil servant to strive for performance. I don't mean they come to work and they um, disregard their responsibilities, but there's nothing to drive them, you know, nothing to inspire them to um, look for performance opportunities. So, so you can see in a lot of these developing countries that they're still committed to their manual paper processes because one, it gives a lot of people a lot of jobs um, by keeping things um, unsophisticated and, and not to modernise with computerization. So, so by not inspiring your civil servants to desire achievements, then, then there's no motivation. So that, so you know, if I look at that, then I don't. I, it's understandable why PFM reforms often don't. While they do make progress, they don't make quick progress. So that's. I, I do think that that you, that civil service reform and PFM reform should go hand in hand. Uh, and I think it's a timely message for us here too, Julie, because uh, now is probably the 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 sweetest sweet spot that we've had in a while to do these kind of reforms with everything that's going on and public anger towards you know waste and now we have uh, rising taxes that have to be paid by individuals and businesses uh, which is one part of pfm i guess strengthening re revenue it's just one tiny part but that not coming alongside some uh, civil service reform i think is just going to uh, make people uh, more and more concerned about, you know, their, you know, what the impact of these reforms are going to be, and feeling like there's one large part of the workforce in the public sector that aren't also having to uh, improve their efficiency and productivity and and all of that. Um, so I think all of these messages are are very valid in Sri Lanka today as well. So I'm I'm going to move on to our third and final question in the three smart questions uh, episode. Um, given all of what's going on in Sri Lanka today, um, public sector reform, while it is on everyone's minds and everybody understands the need for it, and you know people are demanding it, it, it seems to be an intractable problem. Like where do you where do you start? What extent of reform do you um, go for? What's the level of ambition? So from some of the countries you worked in and know of. Um, have you come across any practical strategies that countries can adopt to, to begin this journey and a, a, adopt a, a sensible pathway for reforming the public service? Uh, you know, should it be big bang reforms, doing it all in one go, it's painful, you exert a lot of political uh, capital uh, to, and reduce the chances of resistance, or you know, do it incrementally and slowly to try and better manage that resistance and try and show incremental um, gains and build momentum for that reform. Any, any thoughts on that, Julie? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, there's always that question about big bang or incremental. And um, it, it is an important question because there is, you know, advantages and disadvantages to both. But let me start first with um, what's really important is political buy-in. And, and it's also because these reforms usually um, take more than one election cycle. So it's really important to have a broad political buy-in. So when a reform such as civil service reform is started, it's not rolled back if a new government comes in, that they, they, they've already bought into it and they're going to keep continuing. I mean, that was the case in New Zealand and it was also the case in Australia. Um, you know, with New Zealand, because of the uh, economic crisis of the uh, mid to late 1980s, both all political parties saw that there was a need to, for change. And so they, they did bring in, and so did the public, and so did civil servants. Everybody bought into it because they realised that we are in a, in a, in a, in a um, tricky situation that we need to, to, um, to improve. Australia was also in, in 
I don't think we were in as dire a situation as what New Zealand was, but we also had our um, economic and also political challenges. You know, the the um, the Australian public was um, disappointed in the economic um, the management of the economy from the the government was in 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 place at the time. You know, we had um, a disappointing GDP growth. And um, our, heart, our unemployment rate was quite high at 9%. And so citizens and politicians alike, you know, viewed this as um, evidence of a failure of, of our, our country and that we want, and we could see other countries um, jumping ahead and, and realise that there, there was an opportunity to um, burst onto the global scene, I guess, as, as, a, as a major... As a, as a at least an effective and efficient player, you know, um, you know, so there, there was political will, and I think that's a really important thing. But the political will came about because of the economic situation. So, um, all, all people, all politicians bought into it. So that's really important. I think New Zealand. Uh, sorry, I think um, Sri Lanka is kind of in that place where you could say like despite my political um, uh, beliefs, this is one thing we can agree on. This is one thing we know will be helpful um, for Sri Lanka. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, now's the time. Let's see if the politicians can say, yep, yeah, civil, servant, civil service, service and PFM reforms is something which is going to be good for the country in the long term and we won't roll it back even if different governments get in. So let's get back to whether big bang or incremental. Um, both New Zealand and Australia took the big bang approach, um, but it wasn't easy and it wasn't done without several years of planning. It's not like you can sit down for a couple of months and say, um, okay, we're gonna do this or we're going to do that. Let's have a look at what the impact is and how can we do it? The first thing they did was design the system and socialise that a lot, you know, how would it work? We designed the first draft of the system, both the PFM reforms that were going to happen and the civil servant reforms, service reforms. And then um, looked at our legislation. Um, I know there were questions about whether the um, constitution itself would need to be changed. Um, um, after analysis, it was decided the constitution didn't need to be Change, but certainly the PF, uh, the um, audit, our audit act of um, uh, nineteen oh one did need to be revised and completely um, thrown out, and and two new acts were were implemented: one to cover um, government um, ministries, departments, and agencies, and the second one was to cover um, state-owned entities. So there were changes to laws to make sure that um, we could um, continue. But then the new civil service code, which I think is of most interest, um, that was completely overhauled. Um, people were no longer had jobs for life. People had to sign contracts. They reviewed um, salary scales um, so that they were more in line with the private sector. Um, this was a way that we want, the government wanted to attract qualified um, private sector people. They implemented enormous training programs um, for existing um, civil servants, knowing that you know, people's skills needed to be um, enhanced. They also modernised with IT. Um, every government department was required to implement a financial management information system, and they, they, which needed to be connected to the Minister or the Department of Finance's central system. Um, uh, civil servants now had to go through uh, biannual performance reviews so that, um, and, and were held to it. You know, they had to say what they were going to achieve and, and their managers were taught how to um, do performance evaluations on a constructive basis. So taking a lot of lessons from, from the private sector of how do you inspire and grow and strengthen your human capacity um, of course, there are other things that were, you know, really challenging. The civil service was scaled down. 
um, that, you know, the government or the, the framework required the government to be lean and um, efficient. So, you know, we had to, um, a, a lot of redundancy packages were offered. Um, some were um, voluntary, but others were imposed, particularly people who are at the um, older end of the spectrum, they were offered um, uh, early retirement packages. But there were, were others that were, um, well, either they didn't accept the training that was offered to them to reskill them for a new role. Um, there were people who refused that and, and so they, they were offered redundancy packages. And, and that was that was really challenging to watch. You know, there were a lot of people who had um, worked in the civil service service all their life, and then they were being told that um, um, you know they were no longer needed, and you know, please take this um, this redundancy package and leave. So there, there was there was certainly a, a really real human ele element to it, which was painful, but ultimately necessary. Of course, coupled with that, you know, we had the PFM framework was designed where we had the outcomes and outputs. Each minister and secretary had to sign when their outcomes and outputs were agreed. You had each ministry or department had to go and agree with um, or negotiate with the Ministry of Finance what their outcomes and outputs would be. All outcomes had to prove that they were connected to the overall government's policy priorities. So you couldn't have one government department going off and doing their own thing. And all secretaries of departments had to sign that they will deliver these this level of outputs for the, the budget they received. So it was quite strong that, um, they, that it was the responsibility to manage your um, agency effectively and efficiently was really um, strongly imposed. Um, as, of course, you know, with the new public sector, there was lots of training on um, what the new frameworks would be, what their responsibilities would be. Um, a number of uh, uh, agencies were selected as pilots and Department of Defence, which I was managing, was one of them. So that was really thrilling and super interesting to see all the cogs moving and, and how things were changing and, and seeing um, civil servants respond. Not always. I mean, as I said, I was with defence and defence um, is, you know, always hard to move, to move direction. Um, and there were a lot of uh, military people who um, were, couldn't understand why they needed to change. But over time, we, we socialised them that, you know, we want to make sure you can get your budget for what you want to do. And the way to do that is that you, we have to have the evidence of how you're going to use your budget to deliver these outputs and outcomes. And eventually they came around, but it was challenging. So I don't want to, the, you can't underestimate how difficult it is, but it's certainly doable and Sri Lanka can do it. I mean, I think, um, you know, politically now is your time. You know, your country is really suffering um, in a way it never, in an, even through the civil war, it's not really experienced this type of um, uh, uh, crises. I mean, it's really severe. So I think politically, your political parties could get together and say, yes, we can do this. And I think, you know, better PFM and a better civil service should lead to greater public confidence that the government has better control over the economy and better control and stewardship over um, public resources. So that should um, build political confidence. So it should be a win-win situation. It, you know, politicians shouldn't be um, deterred from doing this type of brutal or drastic or comprehensive civil service reform because it can be a win for them. I also want to point out that there, there was evidence, at least in the Australian um, uh, reforms, that this downsizing of the civil service actually stimulated the private sector. And one sector in particular, I recall, was the IT sector. I mean, certainly it was in the 90s when IT was exploding in any case. But because um, one of the policy decisions in streamlining the, the civil service was to outsource IT, and so the public sector, sorry, the private sector had to pick that up. And so then a lot of the civil servants that were 
that they were attract, attracted also to go out to the to the IT sector. So there can be wins, not just for politicians, not just for the civil service, but also wins for the private sector. So I think, and, and sorry, my preference is big bang, because I think if they if you don't get political buy-in from all, all factions of, of the political spectrum, you could see it disrupted because things will change as political parties change. Right. And I think, Julie, you made a really important point, even with the Big Bang, that Big Bang doesn't mean that it was thought of yesterday, right? Implementing is in right. a Big Bang kind of way, but thinking through it, uh, several years of planning and drafting those plans and looking at legislation that needs to be changed, I think that was a really important takeaway. Uh, and uh, I think particularly in the current context where we are hearing about rather ad hoc measures to address public sector reform issues, you know, going down to a four day week, um, you know, scaling down, you know, work hours, things like that. Uh, I think probably has, can have more dangers where there's a lot of uncertainty and anxiety among public officials about where this is going. Whereas if it's part of a larger plan for civil service reform, at least there is a bit more predictability and appreciation for where things are going. So. Um, Thank, sorry, you want to say something? I think you're absolutely you? right. The, the planning is very, very important. I think civil service reform will have difficulties if you try to do ad hoc. It needs mm. to be comprehensive and really looked at and, and, and discussed over a lengthy period and also socialised with civil servants so they can plan, especially um, ones at the uh, older retirement age. They, can, they might decide, well, I'll, I'll leave now. You, you know, so there's give the civil servants an opportunity to become familiar with what changes are coming and not, not just do ad, ad hoc things. Absolutely. So um, thank you very much, Julie. I just want to you know, recap for our uh, listeners what some of the takeaways uh, for me at least were, and maybe it is for everyone else also. The fact that um, political consensus to conduct these reforms was important so that reforms that typically span multiple governments, multiple electoral cycles don't get derailed. And also the point that often political will came about because of the economic challenges. And that's what we see even in Sri Lanka here today. Um, I think we got an appreciation for the importance of doing civil service reform alongside PFM reform as they can be sort of mutually reinforcing. Mm -hmm. But you also cited examples from countries you've worked in where you've seen failures of well-meaning PFM reform due to completely excluding civil service reform. And I think that's a good lesson uh, for, for Sri Lanka right now as well. Um, and in undertaking some civil service reform, the need to take some workable, sensible, good practices from the private sector, for example, simple things like biannual performance reviews and you know, these performance kind of contracts that need to be signed so that the public sector is focusing on impact and outcomes. Uh, and overall, through all of this, it doesn't have to be politically costly because there'll be greater public confidence that the government has a better control and oversight over public resources. And like you said, it, it can be uh, a win-win. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to share these thoughts with us. I know it's, I'm sure everyone who listens to it will get a lot of ideas of how Sri Lanka should approach this, but also get a sense of the urgency of using this moment in time to do some of this. So uh, thank you so much, Julie. And uh, I, hope, I wish you well in all the work around this topic that you're doing everywhere else. And hopefully at some point, Sri Lanka can benefit once again from your expertise in this area. Thanks very much, Anusha. I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you. And um, yes, I'll come back to Sri Lanka any time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.